Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello. Today we are going to discuss the basic EPR instrumentation. Whatever items are used to make an EPR spectrometer. We have seen in earlier lecture that the, the armor frequency of an electron is given by this. This is the gyromagnetic ratio of electron, this is the magnetic field, this is the frequency of precession. Now, this gamma E gyromagnetic ratio is gives the frequency in angular frequency unit that is radian per second. If you want frequency normal unit let us say nu E it will be gamma E by 2 pi B and, and we have seen the value of this gamma E by 2 pi is 28 point Zero to gigahertz per Tesla. So you see, our typical frequency will be of the order of several gigahertz if the magnetic field is of the order of one Tesla. So this frequency comes in the microwave region. So what do we need to have a spectrometer based on whatever you have understood about the principles of EPR spectroscopy? Just look at this slide here. We need a source of radiation, then we need a sample cell to hold the sample which in this parlance call a cavity, then we need a magnetic field and also detection system. We also have seen the resonance condition is given as H nu is equal to G E beta E B. This is the G factor. This is Bohr magnetron. And this is the magnetic field. And this is the frequency of resonance. And we have just now said that this frequency comes in the micro region for a typical magnetic field of, of the order of a Tesla. So, here once again to recapitulate our earlier understanding that we can either vary the frequency and keep the magnetic field constant or vary the magnetic field and keep the frequency constant. Both are possible in principle, but in practice it is almost always true that we vary the magnetic field and keep the microwave frequency constant. We will see several reasons why that is so. So, we need therefore, is fix and V variable. So, how will a spectrometer look like a simplest possible uh, and a sim simplest possible spectrometer will look like this and here we are comparing a normal absorption spectrometer which you must have seen in optical experiment for example, ultraviolet visual spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy or what not. They have source of radiation, then the monochromator which chooses a particular frequency, then sample cell which is normally called cuvette, radiation goes to this and whatever comes out is measured on a detector. Whenever the radiation is absorbed by the sample at a given wavelength, that change in the signal seen by the detector is in a sense spectrum. 
In that spirit, we can think of a simplest EPR spectrometer which will have a source of microwave radiation K, radiation comes and falls on a sample which is called sample cell is called a cavity and this is kept in a magnetic field north and south and the transmitted radiation is detected by detector. This is all very similar both the cases. Now, in case of optical spectrometer, we can change the di direction of the light, we can bend it, we can focus it using appropriate optical elements. Let us say you can use lens or mirror, we can use uh, any of these optical elements to bring the radiation to the sample and to the detector. But the trouble in EPR spectroscopy is the microwave radiation that is used here, wavelength of this is pretty long. So, typical lambda for microwave is of the order of centimeter. This is a type of spectrometer they normally use has few centimeter wavelength. Now, in that case it is very difficult to have an optical element to focus it. Wavelength is so big that when it goes through any element it gets diffracted very easily. So, you have a source of radiation let us say microwave comes from here, but very easily it will go all over. So, it is so, compared to again here that I have got the radiation source from an optical element going to the monochromator and this radiation can be easily brought to this sample cell maybe with a lens or you can bend it to the mirror, but here the radiation is coming out will very easily get spread out all over. So, whatever radiation comes out to the sample will be so small that the experiment will be very, very difficult to perform. So, the real problem in this micro spectroscopy is how to transmit the microwave. So, for that there are certain tubes which are used to force the microwave to stay inside. So, these tubes which carry microwave are called waveguides. So, here is an example. So, you see the rectangular tube here, rectangular cross section and the hole here through and through hole if you can see it. Yeah, the hole is seen clearly. So, here if the microwave enters here, it is forced to stay inside this, it does not come out. So, these tubes sometimes it is rectangular, it could be also cylindrical, these tubes are called waveguide because it guides the radiation inside it. So, whenever we need to bring the radiation from one place to another place, I can use different type of this waveguide elements. For example, this is a different length here, one is bigger, other is smaller. So, you can join these two to make a bigger waveguide and these are their holes here. And then this could be screwed appropriately to join, but often we need to bend the microwave radiation. In case of optical experiment we use mirror for example, but here we have similarly an arrangement to bend it here bends. So, we can have a microwave which is entering here, it can bending in this way. So, that is possible. So, but you see here because rectangular nature the radiation will have certain polarization that is there will be specific orientation of the, of the electric field and magnetic field inside this tube. So, when you want to change the orientation there are also tube available which is called the twist here. Here, here again see the plane of radiation enters here and gets twisted and then becomes perpendicular to that. Okay. 
Now, naturally, the wavelength of the radiation which is going through the tube has to enter, or in other words, the dimension of the waveguide which is here. this dimension decides what sort of radiation can be carried by this waveguide. Now, here the wavelength has to be smaller than the lambda by 2 has to fit here. So, any wavelength which is bigger than that cannot enter here and therefore, cannot be carried out by carried by this waveguide. So, so, for example, I have another waveguide here, you can see the dimension of this are, this is different from that one. You can see this is a smaller dimension than this one, both ways, this is narrower than this one here. So, this can carry a microwave whose frequency is higher than the frequency that is carried by this one. So, there are certain names given to this various frequency ranges can, that can be carried in a different type of waveguide. I have given you example of rectangular waveguide, but there are cylindrical waveguides also possible. For this particular one, the inner dimension is you see that unit is inches which is very old fashioned, because the microwave technology came into being sometime in 1940s. And there at the time, this unit was very common and that has been continuing since then. And the frequency that can be carried by this waveguide ranges from about 8 to 12 gigahertz. This figures that we carried here. here we give a certain later code to different frequencies that this waveguide can carry. Similarly, this one can carry a frequency which is some let us say 15 to 18 gigahertz, some higher frequency is carried by this one because dimension is smaller. So, in the, the next slide gives you various types of micro frequency and what is the letter code for them. So, S, X, K, Q, E, W, the representative frequency is 3 gigahertz here, 9.5 and then other frequency given here. So, this X band which is here, this is called X band. This is the most popular frequency used in EPR spectroscopy. And corresponding magnetic field is kilo 3.4 kilogauss. So, again in this table you see the various bands of frequencies one can have spectrometer and correspondingly magnetic field will of course, be different. X band is most popular, Q band is also popular which works around 35 gigahertz micro frequency and requires a magnetic field of 12 kilo gauss. Even W band is also available where the micro frequency goes up 95 gigahertz and works around 35 kilo gauss of magnetic field. Once again X band is the most popular frequency. Okay. Next is the source of microwave radiation. Most common source of microwave radiation is a microwave oscillator called klystron. It is a vacuum tube 
inside which electrons are made to undergo acceleration and deceleration. In a very simplistic way, the inside part of the klystron looks like this. There is a filament which is heated and it produces electron. Now, there is a cathode here and there is this is called cathode, this is called anode and this electrons are accelerated through this anode at a very high positive potential. And then there is another electrode here which is called the reflector. And this is kept at negative potential with respect to cathode. So, what is happening here? Electrons are emitted by the filament, it is accelerated by the positive anode and goes through this and then it is reflected by the negative potential is applied here. So, electron sort of goes up and comes down, this is sort the of motions it has. It is of course, a very uh, simplistic picture, nevertheless because of this acceleration and deceleration electron that are experiencing that produces the microwave radiation. This anode is also called the beam or the resonator. So, the, so the frequency of oscillation here decides the frequency of the microwave that comes out. To change the frequency, one can change the physical distance between this beam and the reflector. This gap is changed there. So, that changes the transit time of the electron from here to there and back here. So, that changes the frequency of time period and changes the frequency of oscillation. Also, the frequency of oscillation can be changed by changing the reflector voltage. If you increase or decrease, that will also change the transit time between these two and that can also change the frequency of oscillation. Now, here depending upon the reflector voltage and the beam voltage, the output is going to come. Now, the way cluster behaves, not all voltages are allowed here. In other words, the, the microwave will come out for a, only for a certain allowed voltages of the reflector that is decided by the physical dimension of this. So, we can plot the output of the radiation as a function of the frequency. The frequency of the microwave can be plotted here. a function of power. You know, the, the way the klystron behaves, it does not give constant output power as a function of frequency. Usually, it looks like this, something like this. Now, micro frequency as I said earlier is decided by the physical dimension between these two, it is also decided by the reflector voltage. So, if I keep the dimension constant, keep on varying the reflector voltage, the frequency is going to change. So, this axis could as well be written in terms of the reflector voltage. Now, the here you see then that when the reflector voltage is this and this, there is no output of micro. Only when the reflector voltage is certain allowed value from this to this, the micro power comes out. So, this behavior is characteristic of the klystron and you call this figure that is output power as a function of the reflector voltage is called the klystron mode. Now, 
No, cluster can have more than one mode. What do you mean by that? It may look like this for the certain range of voltage. Let us say this could be the minus 300 to minus 400 volt. That is that is from that is from here to here just for sake of our understanding. That is the class micro power from the class turn has this sort of shape when the left rear voltage goes from minus 300 to minus 400 volt. In other words, if the voltage becomes more negative than that there is no output also becomes less negative than, than that there is no output. But it is possible that for same setting of this one I am get another output of this kind. Very similar, this might be let us say minus 150 volt, this will be minus 250 volt. So, it looks very similar, where again the voltage becomes more negative than minus 250, there is no output, uh, less than minus 150, again there is no output. This is second mode, the another mode here. That is a way a cluster gives more than one mode. Now, one normally chooses that mode which gives the maximum power. This voltage is maximum. That voltage is chosen here for operation of the cluster. Now, other than cluster, more modern micro source that is being used in the EPR spectrometer is called a solid state device and that is called a gun oscillator. This is a solid state. solid state device. Unlike clustron, which is actually based on vacuum tube, everything that is happening here is inside a, in a vacuum tube. This has no such thing as solid state device, but electrons are meant to oscillate because of certain gun effect. We do not go into detail, but we will only distinguish the behavior of this versus that one. Important difference is that the gun out oscillator output as a function of frequency is almost constant. So, that way there is main difference here. Now, here I say the reflector voltage changes the microwave frequency to a certain extent. Here also similarly the voltage that is applied to the gun oscillator diode that also changes the frequency of the microwave. The next item in the spectrometer is the sample holder or the cavity. Now, cavity is a rectangular box or it could be a cylindrical box where the sample is kept. But the important function of this is to ensure that the sample sees the magnetic field of the microwave radiation and not the electric field. Because we have seen earlier that is the magnetic dipole transition which is what we observe in EPR spectroscopy. So, microwave cavity functions a very important role. It ensures that magnetic dipole transition is taking place in the sample. In other words, sample must see mostly the microwave magnetic field and little or no electric field because microwave also can cause electric field transition and that is not what we are trying to look at. So, it two designs are given here, this is a rectangular cavity and a cylindrical cavity. And then there is a hole kept here, we call the iris hole. This 
and the waveguide can enter allow the microwave to enter here through this hole. Okay. That is the way the waveguide is coupled to the rest of the microwave circuit and usually one uses a screw here. And by inserting the screw at the appropriate depth one can cause a proper matching of the microwave radiation to the cavity as it is shown here this green object is the screw and you can see the hole through which the microwave can enter here. Now one can have a cavity which looks like this. small hole here, another small hole here and radiation this is the waveguide. The radiation enters here goes through this and through this iris goes to the cavity and again in, goes out here. So, sample could be kept somewhere here. This is called a transmission cavity. And the cavity we have shown in this picture here is the radiation comes from here, goes through this hole and then gets reflected to the back and then goes through goes out again. So, this is called a reflection cavity. So, we will see that reflection cavity is a lot more useful cavity than this one. As I have said earlier, the sample must see the maximum of the microwave magnetic field and not the electric field. And the way this cavity helps doing that is to form a sudden pattern of the radiation inside this and some places there will be electric field maximum and some other place there will be magnetic field maximum and that is called the mode of the cavity. So, this mode will depend on the dimension of this cavity and also the wavelength that enters here. Now, to understand what a mode is, it will be good to take example of a common microwave device that you almost all of us use and that is the microwave oven. The microwave frequency used in a microwave oven is 2.45 gigahertz and the corresponding wavelength is 12.2 centimeter approximately. So, you see this is a really large wavelength comparable to the food stuff that is used there. In a microwave oven we cook food or we rather we warm food by placing it in the box and that box is sudden as a turntable. So, this keeps moving it. So, the whole box is actually a cavity that we have here. And how does it form a mode? So here, this is the rectangular box which is the microwave oven, and if you see carefully, usually at the top right corner there is a rectangular sort of element there through which the radiation from the microwave generator enters and it stays inside, and this is the rotating plate. Now, for cooking the food, it is electric dipole transition that is used there that is most of the polar molecule the water for example, the most polar molecule that absorbs microwave radiation undergoes rotational transition and then very high rotational frequency it causes the heating. So, it is electric dipole transition. So, here to find out where the electric field is maximum one can do a small experiment to remove the rotating plate and then keep a very thin layer of let us say papad for example or some uh, thermal paper which changes its color from white to black when it is hot and then run the micro oven for some time then what will happen because it is not turning wherever the electric field maximum at that place the maximum heating will take place and the color of the paper will change or the papad may become charred. So, here the experiment which is done and reported in this paper given in this here. So, here. 
So modes in a micro oven. What is done here is that the turntable was removed and the thermal paper was kept and the empty oven was run at 360 watt power for 30 seconds without the rotation and with rotation. Now, here you see there were these four places the maximum heating took place and no heating in this region. So, in other words the way the electric field was forming mode inside the box is that these four places the maximum electric field energy was there. So, that is also the reason why it has to be rotated otherwise the food in this white region will not get cooked. So, turntable job is to cook the food uniformly. So, when it turns this uniformly whole surface becomes hot. You can do the experiment very easily by using Papado for example. Now, this is an empty oven in other words in this language this is an empty cavity that shows the mode pattern of electric field. Now, if we put a sample here the sample is called load here 100 ml of water was kept here a load is written there. Here again the same experiment was done where the turntable was removed and you see that mode pattern has changed compare once again here empty cavity and these four regions have the maximum electric field intensity. Now, just place a little bit of water here immediately the mode pattern has changed. So, that is the important lesson for us that if you do anything to the cavity whenever you place sample or put some sample tube or solvent this is going to disturb the cavity and change its mode pattern. So, here after placing water again we turn the turntable and then see again uniformly it heats here. So, this shows the electric field forms certain standing wave pattern. For a reflection cavity this is very important. So, radiation enters here enters here and gets reflected this way. So, now if the dimension has certain part particular relationship to the wavelength of this radiation then it can form standing wave pattern. So, in that case the radiation will be stored inside it will not come out of that. Not only that when the standing wave forms then depending upon the dimension of this certain places there will be electric field which is maximum and other place magnetic field will be maximum. Now, let us see what sort of mode pattern these cavities have here. This is a rectangular cavity dimension is given here that let us say A is the this broader dimension of a waveguide this is the C, B is the narrower dimension and C is the longest dimension here. Okay. And the iris hole and the coupling screw is shown on the left. Now, for this rectangular waveguide radiation enters here gets reflected and comes out there out of this again. Now, if the wavelength has the certain relationship to the dimension here given by this let us say the dimension A this broader surface is approximately equal to half of the wavelength and B is very narrow. So, that it is less than half the wavelength and C has the exactly twice the half wavelength. In that case standing wave pattern will have this sort of mode electric field lines shown here in red lines this will be forming the standing wave such that it will oscillate in this plane a b plane and the value of the electric field is maximum here and here and minimum at the two surfaces and also at the center of the cavity electric field is maximum. Similarly, the magnetic field modes are given in the blue line magnetic field in intensity maximum at the center and also maximum at the wall and it is very small nearly 0 at the center here and the this center here. So, if you now imagine this rectangular box that magnetic field has exactly maximum intensity here and the surface here and this surface there electric field has minimum intensity at the plane here and here and here. 
Now, this particular mode, you can see that how critical it is related to the wavelength of the microwave which you are working. So, this mode is called TE102 in this parlance of EPR spectrometer and T it stands for transverse electric. The radiation is moving in this direction, the electric field is orthogonal to that, that is oscillation of electric field is perpendicular to the direction, so, that is why it is called transverse electric. And then one stands for this, there half, one half wavelength is this A dimension, zero half wavelength in B dimension, B dimension is so narrow that no half wavelength can fit here and C dimension has exactly twice the half wavelength. So, this rectangular cavity is called therefore, transverse electric 102 mode. Now, you see how carefully it is designed and we can easily figure out now where to place the sample. We can place the sample right at the center of the cavity showing this the two pipes here, this can act as a sample holder right the center of the through the sample, the electric field is 0 and the magnetic field is maximum that is exactly what we need for magnetic dipole transition to take place. Okay. So, this is the placement for sample, this is the sample tube I have shown here, this tube here is the center, similarly here the sample tube is here. Okay. The other popular cavity is called a cylindrical cavity, this is nothing but a small cylinder uh, through which radiation is coupled through on side iris. And here the electric field lines are circular in nature. So, here maximum electric field is approximately the center of this and min, minimum at the center and the magnetic field lines are shown in this dimension. Here is magnetic field lines are maximum at the center and these two walls and minimum at the here as well as here. Now, this mode is called again T e because electric field lines are orthogonal to the direction of the propagation of the radiation transverse electric field and 0 1 1 stands for that there is 0 half wavelength along this circular direction and 1 half wavelength is this direction along, along the radius and another, another half wavelength is along this vertical direction. So, the mode is T 0 1 1. So, this is the cylindrical cavity. Here again the best place to place the sample for EPR experiment is the center of this. So, here magnetic field is maximum and electric field is minimum. So, that is the way I have shown here sample placement is this center of the cylindrical cavity. So, both for rectangular cavity or a cylindrical cavity only one particular frequency can form the standing wave inside this. Therefore, you cannot have a variable frequency EPR experiment. In fact, this is the single most important reason why the EPR spectrometers are al always constructed to work in a fixed frequency mode. This is the reason. How well does a cavity store microwave inside? There is a quantitative way of stating that. In order to understand that, let us guess how the reflection of microwave from a cavity depends on the frequency of the microwave. This is the reflected power. So, cavity could be a rectangular cavity or a cylindrical cavity. Let us say we have coupled the microwave and the frequency of the resonant frequency of the cavity and the microwave they are matching either here or here. So, for that condition correction, let us say we have coupled the microwave to this cavity or this cavity and the frequency of the microwave matches with the characteristic frequency of the cavity. So, at that time the cavity is supposed to store the microwave without reflection, at least the reflection should be minimum. So, let us say at the characteristic frequency of the cavity nu 0, let us say this is the reflection here. here. So, as the frequency of the microwave changes either this way or that way, 
power is going to be reflected from the cavity. So, this will be somewhere here and here. So, if we keep imagining that as the deviation of the micro frequency is higher and higher from the characteristic frequency of the cavity, the reflection will be more. Of course, we have to keep the input power of the cavity constant. So, the, the shape of the curve will be something like this. So, when the micro frequency is very far from the cavity resonance frequency, the power that is reflected will be totally the in input power that goes inside. So, this is the input power, totally power gets reflected. So, here the quality of the cavity or how well it stores the microwave inside it without reflection is, a, is measured in terms of the narrowness of this profile. So, if I call this delta nu, then this quality of the cavity it is universally called the uh, Q value Q Q stands for quality obviously, is defined to be this nu 0 by delta nu. So, with this definition, it is obvious that the narrower the cavity, higher will be the Q value. So, the Q value is a quantitative measure of the quality of the cavity, it shows how well the micro power is stored how well it is stored. So, if it is narrower, then I say that it is better cavity. Why is that? So, in this slide, I have shown this reflection profile of a cavity for two different Q values. So, this shows the response of two different cavities. The red one is sharper and the pink one is broader. So, delta nu for this is smaller than the pink one. So, as the q is defined to be equal to nu 0 by delta nu, this cavity with a red profile is sharper and higher is the q, higher is the sensitivity should be apparent from here. So, this is the place where the cavity is matched with the micro frequency so well that let us say reflex is minimum 0 percent and maximum when it is further with maximum away from the new 0. Now, if there is any disturbance in the cavity or change in the in the characteristic property of the cavity, then for a small change this pink cavity for a small change the reflection from the cavity will be much larger for the red profile than the pink profile. Back to this, for a very small change in this frequency the red is going to reflect a lot more than the pink one. So, any signal which depends on the reflection from the cavity will be more with the cavity has very sharper response. So, that way the sensitivity comes into the instrument. The Q is also defined in this way that is how much power rather how much energy is stored in the cavity divided by energy dissipated Per cycle. So, the higher the Q, the lesser the amount of energy that is lost per cycle. So, it stores 
energy much more efficiently if the Q is high. So, these two are actually equivalent definition. So, in a spectrometer the one which has a higher Q that cavity can store energy more efficiently. So, the spectrometer also becomes sensitive because any small disturbance in the cavity because of the absorption of microwave the reflection of the cavity will be correspondingly higher if the cavity is Q is also higher. Now, here these two are reflection cavity and I also said in earlier that, uh, uh, that this sort of transmission cavities were also used early days, but the Q of transmission cavities are much much lower than Q one can get for in reflection cavity. Therefore, this is not a very sensitive cavity and therefore, these are not used anymore. Reflection cavities have much higher Q even between these two this is the rectangular cavity and this is the cylindrical cavity. Q of cylindrical cavity is about two times higher than this one. It is about two times higher than a rectangular cavity. So, the spectrometer that uses a cylindrical cavity will be about two times more sensitive than a spectrometer that uses a rectangular cavity. Okay, let us summarize now what we have discussed in this class. Today we have discussed uh, the following topics, the source of micro need for wave guides and how it restricts the uh, fixed frequency experiment then he talked about the role of cavity and the and the q value and its importance we will continue our discussion on the other components of an EPS spectrometer and see how a EPS spectrometer looks like afterwards in the subsequent lecture. That is it.